Welcome to Conversations with D&T, where we try to gain understanding to some of the more controversial passages in the Bible and how this understanding enhances our spiritual journeys. Hi, I am Diana. And I am Tiffany. And we, we are, are D&T. D&T. This is a ministry of Langsburg United Methodist Church. The purpose of our podcast is to help people become comfortable in asking questions about the content of the Bible, to demystify it, if you will. As we do this, we enhance our spiritual journeys. So today we're going to talk about the story of Job and wrestle with the problem of evil's presence in the world. So Diana, why don't you get us started with a brief summary of the story of Job? So Job is this man who is very faithful to God. Um, and um, he has this incredible amount of horrible things that continue to happen to him. And every time a horrible thing happens to him, um, he continues in his faith in God. Mm-hmm. Even when his friends and family continue to say, why do you continue to believe Yep. And he just says, because God will take care of me. And even when he knows that God is doing this to him, mm-hmm. he continues to believe that God will take care of him. Mm-hmm. Even to the point of near death. Near death. I mean, he loses all of his children. Yes. He loses all his, his land, everything. All of his earthly possessions. Everything. Everything of value is gone. Except for his faith. And his life. And his life. But close to losing. Yes, close yes. to losing his life. Yes. For sure. And and overall, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the premise of the story begins uh, with a conversation between uh, the devil and God. Correct. And saying that, I'm, that if you believe... Mm-hmm. That Job is so pious, if you will. Yeah. Test him. Yep, test him. So, so the whole premise of the story is that this is a competition between the devil and God. Um, and God is testing Job and his faith. Um, and Job does ultimately prove faithful. Um, but this story begs a really important question. Is it true? Did it really happen? this way and it, what is the devil who is the devil and and how does that affect our lives today so i think that is an excellent question and when i read this i look at it as a battle of good and evil mhm and so that's where i begin and then the second thing that i look at is i have to go back to genesis mhm and creation Uh, the creation story. And so each time God created something, God says it was good. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in that creation story is evil created. Yep. And so that's, for me, the key. Mm -hmm. So where does evil come from? Yes. So this is the, this is the question that it really boils down to where, what is the origin of evil? Um, and for me, uh, Evil is a product of human creation. It is a product of humanity attempting to become co-creators with God in a way that is not productive, um, in a way that that hurts creation rather than um, helps creation. Right. I, I, I agree with that. And then if we go back to what we talked about when we said, what is the Bible? Mm-hmm. And we talked about it is a story of a people getting to one God Mm -hmm. at a place and a time. Yep. Correct? Yes. So this is obviously an Old Testament story. So this is, I think, a time where a people were trying to struggle with where does evil come from? Where does evil come from and how do we remain faithful? Right. So um, encourage it, it. It's really a story, and we f- we see a lot of this from from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Right. Encouraging people to remain faithful in the sp- in spite of um, the trials and tribulations that they're facing, um, because joy does come in the morning. 
It does. And I also think that it's, it, it is interesting that um, if I go back to my um, rule of life that we talked about, and it, it's about um, basically it has to be life-giving, and back to your rule of life, which is basically the great commandment, right? Yep, yep. How does this help me love God, myself, or my neighbor? Mm-hmm. Right. And then if we look at about how we both view God, which is basically love, mm-hmm. I, have, I struggle with this passage of why God would do a bet, mm-hmm. first of all. I, I mean, yeah. basically, you know, and then... Um, why God would make such horrific things happen. So I, so here's something I struggle with, and, and, and is that, does God make things happen? So when I hear somebody say, well, God took them to heaven, um, that is, you know what the opposite of that is? That means that all the bad stuff that happens in your life, God made it yep. happen. Yep. As equally as all the good stuff in your life, God made that happen. I, I'm not sure. Then, then why did God give us free will? We talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. So if God is making all this stuff happen in your life, where's the free will? I have a, I, I, so I can't make that work in my mind. Okay, mm-hmm. so so that's very contradictory to having free will. Yep. So this story of Job doesn't fit with the God that I know is love. Yep. That there would be this bet with the devil, and that God would do all these bad things. Yeah. But as I unpack the story and go back to what the Bible is then I see this as a people trying to struggle what is evil Mm -hmm. and how do we deal with it and what is God doing during this time of this incredible struggle. Yep. And so I look at it as God's not making it happen, but God is holding us. God is there. Mm Mm-hmm. And you know those pictures that you see of, of one set of footprints on the... Oh, yes, I love this poem. Yeah, on the, um, on the, sand. On the beach, on the yep. sand. And I was there, I was carrying you kind of thing. Yep. That's what I always see in this story. Somehow that's the image that always comes to my mind. So just as you were talking, um, an experience from my life came to mind... Um, When I was in college, I participated in a service learning opportunity. Um, And as a part of that, we studied the Holocaust. And then we traveled to Poland. And Mm -hmm. we went, uh, we visited Auschwitz and Birkenau. Um, We went to Wroclaw, where the only remaining uh, (laughs) remaining synagogue um, from the night of Kristallnacht, the only, the only stand the only standing mosque, and the only reason they left this one was because it was attached to nearby buildings. So to destroy it, they would have had to destroy other non-Jewish buildings. Um, As a part of that experience, um, we visited um, Auschwitz, and, and I went on that journey trying to ask the question that Elie Voicel asks in his book, Night. Where was God? Mm. Um, I went there with that question. And as I was walking along the train tracks in Auschwitz, um, God just came over me. And, And it was as if I was standing there. The train cars were there. The people were being herded off of the train um, it it felt like it was snowing, but it was warm. And it was the ash from the furnace uh, just falling all around. And I, I, I watched as they separated, you know, the people who would go to um, the gas chambers and the people who would remain, remain to work. And uh, 
No. I just followed this one, this one woman carrying an infant in her arms. And she went to the gas chamber. And I watched as they were in the gas chamber. Um, as the gas began to enter the chamber, um, they're all afraid. Um, but the realization that comes over this woman as the infant dies in her arm. And that was my answer. God is there with us, holding us in our suffering, um, just as that woman held her infant, even as she knew her infant was taking its last breaths. And she would soon be following her in that. Um, God is there in our suffering and our sorrow and our struggles. Uh, just as God is present in our celebration and our joy. Uh, does God make those things happen? No. I, I don't believe that God does make those things happen. Um, does God let those things happen? <sighs> Unfortunately, God gave us free will. And it is our actions, our human actions, that, that result in many of these evils in the world. And, and we're not answering the question of the problem of natural evil at this time. That's, that's a conversation for another podcast. Um, but, but it is my firm belief that, that the evil in the world is a result of our human actions yeah. and our human inactions. Um, but if we bring this back to Job... Um, <laughs> You gotta let me catch my breath. That story was incredible. Yes. It, uh, it, uh, it's heartbreaking. Yes. yes, but I understand. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Come back to Job. So if we bring it back to Job, um, all of his friends uh, try to sit with him in his suffering, and and they, they keep questioning him and asking him, or, or trying to justify what's happening, and and saying, you know. Oh, God did this for this reason, or this reason, or that reason, and um, you, there's no reason for you to remain faithful because God has abandoned you, essentially, is, is each of their arguments. Right. And Job keeps on saying, no, God is with me, and I will remain faithful to God. Um, and, and I think that is a powerful testament to the fact that God was, God was still there with Job, even in his suffering. Did, did God cause Job's suffering? No. But God was there. And I think that when you look at the history of the Holocaust, which is an interesting story, and there is no way that I am an expert of it, but I do have a few folks that um, are friends who had family and have shared their family stories. They never felt that God abandoned them. Um, and that they understood this to be human evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you're bringing up a, 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 an excellent point about that. And so as you bring back this to the Job story, and you talk about that their friends tried to sit and said that God abandoned them, their faith was gone, mm -hmm. but Job's never left. Right. And so, you know, so when you go back to the story, the beginning of Job's story, and there was this so-called bet between God and the devil, um, it was interesting, you know, so so was the, was the devil working on Job's friends to say that God abandoned mm -hmm. and to, had to help the test? We don't know that, really. Mm-mm. But it's an interesting question. And the other question I've heard people ask me is, so does that mean that free will is always bad? That's... Mm -hmm. Or a similar question is uh, to say, did, did God surrender some of God's power to humanity when we were given free will? Um, because by giving us free will, God... God, in a sense, lost some of God's opportunity to manipulate the world. 
interesting, but then that would have to bring us back to the garden. Mm-hmm. And did Adam have free will? And did Eve have free will? Mm-hmm. And I would say the, question, the answer to that question is yes, because if they didn't have free will, they would not have taken from the tree. Mm-hmm. So they've always, humanity always has had free will. So that was never something that God gave away. Mm-hmm. It was something that God built into humanity. Yep. Um, and so um, I don't think that God ever gave away the power because I don't think God ever wanted puppets. God never wanted to. T- God is not, God did not create us to be his playthings. Exactly. God created us to to live in to the beauty of God's creation, to care for God's creation, um, and to build a better world. And to care for each other. Yes. And that's the important part of it. It, it, It's not only, and that's the thing that we have to remember, and that we constantly forget. And that's the piece also of Job's story. I mean, every time that we go back, and look at the stories in, in the Bible and in the Old Testament, you still always see the great commandment. Mm-hmm. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? Which Job did. Which Job did. All along. All of them. And love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. Okay? And so that, it always, always comes back to that. Love God's creation. Love your neighbor. Love God's creation. Your neighbor is God's creation. It's always coming back to that. Old Testament, New Testament, no matter what, it is always coming back to that great commandment. Mm -hmm. It just took the New Testament to pull it out into those very short phrase that Jesus said. Yeah. Right? It it took the whole Old Testament story to make it a reality, to to get to it, right? Because it was meeting people in the place of where they were at at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And coming to that one God, to our one God. And Jesus just put it down into an elevator speech, right? Yeah, that elevator speech right there. Yeah, and so it never, it's so consistent. And, and that's the thing that we have to understand throughout all of the Bible, Old and New Testament. That is the consistent story all the way through. And each one of these, and as you read every passage, you will always find that as the story, as the moral, as the lesson. Yep. And so, you know, as we go through and we study theology and we study all these various concepts of it, it always comes down to that. It just helps us unpack it. Mm-hmm. And helps us begin it. So so as we get to this whole thing about good and evil and um, spirits of evil and all of this kind of stuff... It still gets back down to that. that it does. It does. It does. So um, as you're talking, um, it reminds me of the United Methodist Baptismal Vows, um, which which we say usually once or twice a year as we renew our baptismal covenant with God. Um, but one of the lines is, um, do you um, commit to resisting the evil powers of the world and the spirits uh, that resisting the Oh, my gosh. Oh, I know. It's, we, we had it. Where did it go? <laughs> uh, resisting the spiritual forces of wickedness in whatever forms they present themselves. And, and for me, uh, the spiritual forces of wickedness are not some outside uh, force that bears down on us, as, as is articulated in the story of Job with, with the devil. Um, but it's... It's a spiritual force within us, and it yes. exists within each of us, and it's this temptation to to take the easy road, the temptation to slide into our anger and our frustration and to lash out at the world around us, rather than to do what God has called us to do, which is to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Um, it's those spiritual forces within us that say, we're not good enough. Yes. We're not enough. Um, someone else is always better than us. But the truth is, God created each of us as our own person. 
for our own purpose, with our own gifts. And living into those gifts is how we resist those spiritual forces of wickedness uh, that exist within us and within the human condition. Exactly. I always say to people that I work with who have been traumatized in some way, whatever it may be, never apologize for your space. Mm -mm. Never. Because God put you here. God's not apologizing. Yep. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I, I, I totally... I totally agree with where you're where you're coming from, and I think that as um, as Westerners, and this need for us to prove everything scientifically, we take words so literally. So when you say things like spiritual forces. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we don't realize that spiritual can also just be our mind mm-hmm. and where that comes from. And I, and I tend to agree with that. And one of the biggest forces I think that we have that we don't understand is do nothing. Mm-hmm. And that do nothing is actually a choice. Oh, my gosh. And yes. it's actually a path. So when we, when we do the communion liturgy, which obviously we haven't been doing very often during this COVID pandemic, um, I, I typically make a point to, of having the confession Yes. before we approach um, the table. And, and a part of that is we confess that we have failed to love God and our neighbor and what we have done and in what we have left undone. So... So our sin and our falling into the temptation of the spiritual forces of wickedness within us doesn't just happen in the things that we say and we do. It happens in the things that we, we don't do. Whether it's an active or a passive choice not to do those things. But it can be as simple as not being polite to the person who's checking you out at the grocery store. And I, and I don't mean somebody checking you out in a sexual exactly i mean i mean the the person i mean the cashier yes yeah running your groceries through the the pos Uh, system yes so point of sale you know not being polite to that person can can be a perpetuation of of sort of the spiritual force of wickedness that are existing within them they could have be having a horrible day in a simple thank you or a simple God bless you, or a polite conversation with that person can be that thing that that brings them back into the light, um, that brings them back into a sense of joy and purpose, um, rather than being stuck in the monotony of their day-to-day lives and, and the struggle. I mean, how many of us go to the cashier, go to the checkout, and if something's on sale and it doesn't ring up right, we get upset. Like, it's their fault that it didn't get put into the system right. Right. And then how many of us take that out on them? Exactly. How many people do they see every day? You could have been the 10th or the 20th or the 30th person that they have seen that day with that sale item. <sighs> yeah. So what is the new term now? The Karens. Yes. The Karens of the world and, and the Kens. I think that's what they call them now. And, yeah. And and then and and if you witness that happening, you sitting there and just watching it and not stepping in yep. is a do nothing course. Yep. Or when you see somebody who is being um, racially or or sexually intimidated, discriminated, and you're not stepping in. Those are also do-nothings, and those are equally as bad. There's been this um, this thing going around on Facebook recently, the story of a mom and, and her little daughter, um, young daughter, and the young daughter doesn't want to give grandpa a hug. Oh, yes, I've seen that story, yes. Right? And and we have a choice in that state, in, in that section, or in the... In the instances like that 
we can choose to say nothing. As a parent, we can choose to say nothing. Or we can choose to teach our child the valuable lesson that their body is their own. They have agency over it and over what people do to them. Yes. And they have the choice to consent. So we have that choice to stand up and say to the grandfather, you know, no, she, she just doesn't want to hug right now. Maybe later. And, and, and that empowers the child to, you know, if she does want to give grandpa a hug, to be able to do that on her own terms, uh, to consent. And that, that empowers um, that small child. Right, and, and I, every kid goes through that phase. I remember my nieces and nephews going through that phase where they just didn't want it anymore. And um, it was like, okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up where I went through that, and I had this aunt that just was like, you know, just wanted to hug on you and then pinch your cheek and put her lipstick all over your face. It was like, no, I don't, yeah. no, leave me alone. I don't want that. It's not, I'm not comfortable. And and at the time, it was just sort of like, respect your elders and do what they want. And it was like, no, this is, this is not, this does not feel good to me. Um and, and after seeing some of those things go around on Facebook, I've been really intentional. I'm not a parent. I do want to clarify that. I'm not a parent, so I can't own, own any, any feelings for parents. But um, I've been very intentional with my nieces and nephew um, that when I go to visit them, I say, you know, can I have a hug? Exactly. Or can I hug you? Or can I? Right. And I also, with little children, like on our farm, mm -hmm. because we're open to the to the public, I will say, to, I will also ask the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, and I'll ask the child or I'll ask the parents. I ask both. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just, it's the right thing to do. One, just given our atmosphere in the United States with everything going on. But the other thing is exactly what you're saying is they have a right to own their bodies. Mm -hmm. Particularly young girls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Young young boys too though they they Absolutely. they too are very vulnerable, very. Um, but it it teaches an important life lesson, and and we you know we have that choice. Every time we see something like that, we have that choice. Do we do something, or do we not do something? And and sometimes choosing not to do something is is us succumbing to the spiritual forces of wickedness within us. It's just, we don't want to expend that energy. We're, we're tired. Right. You know, we can be tired, whatever. We, we can have a million excuses. Um, but the truth is, we do have to confess that, you know, there are times that we have failed to do things that we should have done that would have extended love and grace. Right. And let's bring, let's bring this full circle back around in terms of not so much Job, but back to the Bible, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's a lot of feminist theology out there, um, and a lot of written about Paul. But one of the things that I think about Paul is, he is probably one of the first that really, besides Jesus, that really struggled with the role of women, particularly in their culture. Mm -hmm. And he eventually comes around. I mean, Jesus is real clear. Mm -hmm. Women are not owned. They are who they are in their own rights. And um, there is, um, you know, Mary Magdalene in all rights was a disciple. And so many other women, too. Yeah, and so many other women. Um, and Paul eventually, I mean, there's a lot of criticism that Paul was kind of anti-woman, if you will. But there's also a, a lot out there that's being written now that Paul came around. Well, not and, only that, he was a pioneer uh, in terms of women's rights within the Roman culture of the time. Exactly, exactly. And when you look at who he put in charge of some of the startup churches um, of the time, he, it was women. It was women. Because and, women get things done. <laughs> yes, this is true then, and it was true then, and it's true today. Yes. No, 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 we don't want to bash. No, we so, don't. <laughs> but... Exactly. And, and I think sometimes that gets forgotten. And a lot of times we take stuff, unfortunately, to meet a need. This is where we pull stuff out of the Bible. We take it out of context. We take it out of context. Too. And that's where it's important for us to remember that the Bible is a story of a people in a particular place in a particular time 
trying to understand and get to one God. Right. And if you pull things out of context, to me, that's a spirit of evil. Oh, yes. That's a good one. Because, I mean, it is something that we actively choose to do. Um, and and I think um, part of our human condition, condition teaches us to do that. You know, to, to, to read something and to take it as fact. Right. Um, and then to take it, you know, from that, from that context and take it into our context today. Um, I had a conversation with a, with a gentleman um, shortly after I moved here to Langsburg. And he was very quick to quote scripture back and forth at me. And, and I was like, I, I don't look at scripture that way. I look at the scope of scripture. Yes. And the scope of scripture is love. Love God. Love one another. Love yourself. Um, and and I, I fully believe, as John Wesley would say, that, that all scripture um, has value and merit for teaching and helping us to move forward on that journey um, toward perfection in love. And that brings us right back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is, is that when you start to unpack it, no matter where you are in the Bible, it always comes back to the great commandment, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so... Again, I think this story of Job has some incredible lessons in it as we tried to unpack it today. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, again, was something may feel very horrible as you sit down and you, and you wrestle with it and you really discuss it and put it in the context of God's love, mm-hmm. you find the life-giving message. Yep. So what do you think? Good place to leave today? I think so. Um, if this podcast brought you brought up any questions for you or concerns, please uh, let us know. And, and uh, if you have any other burning questions and topics you would like us to cover, you know, send those our way and we'll, we'll do our best to address them. So again, thank you for joining us and we hope you have a blessed week.